Hi guys. This is an addendum to the previous episode that includes all the things I either forgot or couldn't fit in. First of all, thank you, Jolie Legal, I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, for pointing out that I didn't really go into enough detail regarding precisely why Pluto isn't a planet anymore. And since I kind of told you that you would know this by the time these videos were over, that's a bit on me. It's just that I've spent so long writing about it that I just assumed it was obvious to everybody. The niggling and lawyering that people have engaged in to either credit or discredit Pluto's demotion are outside the scope of the series, but I'll try and sum them up quickly. The IAU's final definition is... 1. A planet is a celestial body that A. is in orbit around the Sun, B. has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium or nearly round shape, the only word you need to know in that sentence is round, and C. has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. 2. A dwarf planet is a celestial body that A. is in orbit around the Sun, B. has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic or nearly round shape, C. has not cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, and D. is not a satellite. 3. All other objects, except satellites, orbiting the Sun, shall be referred to collectively as small solar system bodies. And they capitalize that, so presumably we're supposed to be calling them SSSBs. Clearing the neighborhood is a peculiar phrase, and comes across as a bit of a buzzword, but it does have a fairly solid foundation. It's now pretty much accepted that our solar system began its life as a swirling disk of rock-sized particles. As time went on, Larger lumps in the disk began to draw more material toward them and increase in size. As they increased in size, their gravity increased, leading to more material being drawn toward them. Eventually, they got so big that they either swallowed up all the material within their gravitational reach or ejected it into another orbit, leaving the eight large objects we refer to as planets. But there exist regions of the solar system, such as the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt, where Either due to the gravitational influence of Jupiter, or simply being too far out to come together, bodies may become large enough to be round, but cannot sweep their orbits clean like proper planets. Ironically, arguably the first person to solidify that foundation was none other than Alan Stern. That's right, the same Alan Stern who fought tooth and nail to keep Pluto in the Planet Club, to the point of coining the now ambiguous term dwarf planet. In the year 2000, Stern and his colleague Hal Levison calculated a term that they called Lambda, which defined an object's ability to clear its orbit of similar objects within a time span equal to the age of the universe. So defined, Jupiter would have a Lambda of 1.3 billion, Earth 153,000, and Mars 5,100. Pluto, on the other hand, would have a Lambda value of 0 0.003, while Eris's value would be 0 0.002. Stern and Levison argued that any object with a lambda value of less than 1 could be placed in a separate category they dubbed Unterplanets. It should be noted, however, that Stern and Levison never suggested that Unterplanets were not planets. Other attempts to quantify clearing the neighborhood have also been made. After the IAU's decision, Stephen Soter, an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History, coined the term planetary discriminant for the ratio of the mass of an object to the mass of all the matter known to cross its orbit at least once. By that calculation, Jupiter would have a planetary discriminant of 62,500, Earth 1.7 million, and Pluto 0 0.08. A less empirical, more theoretical approach was devised by astronomer Jean-Luc Margot in 2015, which employed only the mass of the object, the mass of the star, and its orbital distance. While not based on observational data, it had the advantage of being applicable to extrasolar systems as well as our own. Under Argos formula, Jupiter would have a value of 40,000, Earth 810, and Pluto 0 0.03. Arch-Pluto skeptic David Jewett argues on his website that, quote, the classification of Pluto gets much more discussion than it deserves, and provides a link to Margot's paper as a means to put a lid on it. And, well, that's kind of that. A bit duller than I'm used to, but then this topic gets a lot more people excited than you'd think. On a lighter note, I'd also like to mention a few things I learned about Walter Bada. You know, the guy who got the whole Kuiper Belt thing kicked off in 1920. 
Uh, first of all, I did say in my original video that he coined the term supernova, and that is technically true, although I should have said that he co-coined it with Fritz Zwicky, the guy who first hypothesized the existence of dark matter. But the one thing I really wanted to mention was that he was a German who emigrated to the United States in the 1930s, and you can imagine how problematic that would turn out to be because he didn't bother to apply for American citizenship because, apparently, he lost his documents while moving house and then decided he'd lost patience with the bureaucracy. So, yeah, he didn't do it. And so, once the U.S. joined the war, he was declared an enemy alien and confined to his workstation around the Mount Wilson Observatory. But... It turned out that was a good thing for him because, with all the other astronomers drafted into the war effort, he pretty much had the telescopes to himself, and thanks to wartime blackouts, the clearest skies he could ever have wished for. It was largely thanks to those conditions that he was able to make the astronomical discoveries he eventually did, so it's funny how things turn out sometimes. Oh, and remember that little love story about Pluto's moon and how it was eventually called Charon? Well, there's a little sequel to that story in the discovery of the moon of Eris, which was originally called Gabrielle until they needed to find a more mythically appropriate name for it. And the name that Brown chose for it was Dysnomia, which is the daughter of Eris and the demon spirit of lawlessness. A reference, of course, to Lucy Lawless. But the real story is that, just like James Christie, Brown had recently married when he discovered Gabrielle, and, like James Christie, chose to name it in part after his wife, whose name is Diane, or Di. In keeping with the tradition begun with Sharon of mispronouncing mythical names for love, Brown pronounces the name of the moon Dysnomia. I really wanted to give you an idea of just how impassioned the IAU debate really was, because unfortunately, a lot of the records of that debate have disappeared or been disappeared by the IAU, and the level of anger and offense that people took was pretty intense. I mean, particularly by Julio Fernandez. I mean, he really laid it out there. If anyone knows where you can find a video of the August 22nd plenary session, I would really love to show it to you guys. And yes, Pluto lovers, it is true that the arrival of New Horizons at Pluto and recent stellar occultation studies have shown that Pluto is, in fact, larger than Eris, by a whopping 2%. This doesn't really change things, though, because, as was already established by the orbital mechanics of Eris's moon Dysnomia, Eris is still 27% heavier than Pluto. And in astronomy, mass matters more than size. I do want to apologize, though, to the Wikipedia user, and I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly, Lassumpti, who created the wonderful image uh, that I so abused in my last video, for deliberately misrepresenting his data. He actually had Pluto as larger than Eris, and I swapped them around. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind. There were a couple of large objects found by Brown's big survey that I didn't get a chance to mention because they didn't really fit into the narrative. The most obvious one was Orcus, which was found between Haumea and Eris. It wasn't even mentioned in Brown's memoir, which is kind of odd, because it's kind of interesting in its own right. It's basically an anti-Pluto, and I didn't make that up. It's about half the size of Pluto, and like Pluto, it has its own moon, and its orbit is nearly identical, except that it's mirrored. In the next episode, I will get into Plutinos and what they are and how they work. But for now, let's just say that after Pluto, Orcus is the largest of them. The next one doesn't have a name. It's just 2007 OR10. And it was actually found, as you can probably tell from the name, after the vote. So it doesn't really have a role to play in that story. But interestingly, it was found by a graduate student named Meg Schwamm. And it is currently the largest object in the solar system without a name. And here's the kicker. 2017 marks the end of the period where the discoverer has priority in naming rights. Pretty soon, anyone will be able to name it. In case you wanted some tips on what you might call it, it's basically another heiress. So there's your starting point. Finally, a note to my very patient viewers. The next video is going to be hard to make for me. I am not a scientist. 
I have credits in history, and I've basically been coasting a little by focusing mainly on history up to this point. But now the history's over. From here on out, it's going to be hardcore science, and I want to get it right. So I don't know when the next video will be ready, but I won't release it until I'm absolutely certain that it is. So please continue to be as patient as you have been. Thanks.